Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 3. I'm going to kind of go back on my tracks a little bit. It's been a while since I did Bible study. You know, there's days sometimes, especially in winter hits, I don't feel good. Just came back from vacation. But I am ready to dig into the Word of God. We are in Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Get your Bible out. Follow along with me. Or Pure Bible Search software. Download free. PureBibleSearch.com. Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, it works amazing. Follow along with us and let's study this pure book. This undefiled, incorruptible Word of God. I love it. Oh, foolish Galatians. Okay? Obviously, Paul was not uh, Joel Osteen. Uh, that's a negative confession. Joel Osteen believes that if you say, like, like Paul said, you foolish Galatians. Well, he thinks, Joyce Myers thinks this way, a lot of people that follow them do, that what he did was he spoke foolishness over those people, and now they're foolish because he said they were. Oh, foolish Galatians. And everybody's like, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh. Oh, good grief. When, as being a pastor, you, you learn to love people, the people that God sends to this place, I have to love them. I have to care for them. I have to, um, have to long suffer with them. They have to long suffer with me. We have to have patience with one another. Um, and I don't want to just go around beating everybody over the head all the time and telling them how bad they are. But there are times when the office and the responsibilities of that office require me to say that's not right and you're being foolish in your ways and in your thinking and I'm going to use the Word of God to correct it. All right? There comes times when it has to be done. But a shepherd doesn't always just beat his sheep God designed those sheep to not be satisfied until they're in the flock following the shepherd. And I think that's how God designs His true believers. We have the Holy Spirit. God gives us people that we follow. We get in line. We march behind them. And that's how it is. But again, every now and then, He's got a rod and a staff. And we as the sheep find comfort in knowing that if we get out of line, that rod and staff is going to bring us back in line, either the easy way or the hard way, one way or the other. And I've had it both ways. Anyway, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Notice the words that he's using here. These words mean something. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. I want to know one thing he's saying. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you keep all ten commandments and then you got the Spirit? Is that how it, is that how it worked? Okay, I did. I talked to a guy yesterday. And I mentioned it on Pastor Mike Online. He was he boasting to me about how he keeps the Sabbath and how all you other people and me, we don't. We got the mark of the beast on us. And I asked him point blank. I said, do you ever, does your eyes ever fix on something that your flesh wants or your eyes want? Do you ever lust? He said, absolutely not. And I was kind of taken aback that he would actually say that he doesn't lust after things. And I did, I called him out on it. I said, I don't believe you. You are lying through your teeth. He would not be honest about it. He's wanting, and this this whole, this is all part of this Galatians and what Paul wrote all throughout his writings and what the, the fundamental doctrine of Bible Christianity is. Saved by grace, not by works. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by you were good for a week, you were good for 10 days, you were good for a month or a year? No. Because in the day that we have righteousness and in the day that we transgress, Ezekiel 33 says all of our righteousnesses are gone. We destroyed whatever righteousness we had by one sin. One sin. 
So it is impossible for us to receive the blessings of God, the gifts of God, the Holy Spirit of God, by the working of faith. Or, excuse me, by, by the works of the law. Now, correct that. We receive it because we believe it. We believe this Bible. So he says in verse 3, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You'd be surprised. The number of sermons that you'll hear from people that they may not come out and say it, but they just hammer you and hammer you and hammer you on how they expect you to live. And they tell you, if you'll live the way I tell you to live, then God will give you all these blessings and you'll be closer to God and you'll have a better portion of the Spirit. That's not what it says. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? No. Because the real honest Christians, having begun in the Spirit, recognize and realize that our flesh is getting less capable of serving God every day that we live. The older I get, I'm not getting better in my flesh. I'm getting weaker in my flesh. Now, that weakness takes the form of illnesses, uh, strength. There are things that I can't do. As a, this is the reason why there are no 50-year-old professional football players in America. Okay, They just can't do it. can't keep up with it. So my flesh is waxing older, older, and decaying more and more. But my faith is what's growing. The more I read this Bible, and the more I see how God works, how God works in my life and other people's lives, that just increases my faith. And I just, you know, I believe the Bible. But it's hard to describe. I believe the Bible. But when I read that, I really believe the Bible. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. And so, uh, the last time we were together, we were working on looking at the purpose of this, of this particular study. And what provoked me to get into the book of Galatians, because if you remember, way back, we were doing Revelation, and I just kind of felt like maybe God would take it in a different direction. And I've been I've been answering a lot of questions with people concerning the Hebrew Roots movement, uh, Torah keepers, Sabbath keepers, um, sacred name people, Roman Catholicism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses um, all the isms that are out there. They always add a performance of a ritual, a performance of a work, the payment of money, whatever. They always add these rituals and these rules and regulations and guidelines as a way to get God to bless you or to receive you or you're closer to God because you call him by his real Hebrew name and all these pagan Sunday go church goers, they call him Hey Zeus, naming him after a Greek god Zeus. That's the kind of stuff they say. And the reason why I'd, I wanted to get into Galatians was all of these false movements and these false teachings, every one of them on their website has a study of the book of Galatians. And the reason why they do that is Galatians, the way it's written in the King James, destroys the entire foundation of their doctrine. And the first, second, third, and fifth floors of it. All right, and the fourth floor. But anyway, they, des they it destroys their doctrine. So what they have to do is they have to lead you and guide you through this maze of unbiblical ideas and concepts to make you think that even though Paul said, you know, you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith, he doesn't really mean that. What he really means is. Hearing the faith and doing the law. See, that's the kind of stuff they'll they'll spin it that way. And so what I wanted to do was just go line upon line, precept upon precept. Here is what the Bible says. Not this commentary, not this guy's observations, not this uh, if if it was if the New Testament was still written in its original Hebrew form, it would have said this. That's some of the stuff they come up with. They twist the teachings of Paul in Galatians. They twist and, and rest, the Bible says, W-R-E-S-T, which is like wrestling, two guys wrestling together. 
They rest the scriptures, twisting it around to make it say something that it's not saying. Um, they believe that we can achieve, I read my notes here, we can achieve pleasing God with our righteousness, but the truth is we can't do it. We don't have any righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. So, we receive the Spirit, we preach, we teach, we witness, we testify, we on occasion, God will use us to perform a miracle in somebody's life. I absolutely believe that. But it's done by grace through faith and not by works of righteousness. I can tell you without any hesitation whatsoever that some of the greatest things that God has ever given me, shown me in the scripture, opened my eyes to certain concepts and certain things and given me an understanding of the Bible was at times when I absolutely didn't deserve it. Not at all. If you look back on your life and all the great things that God has done to you, in you, through you, for you, around you, by you, you may not have been at your best when that happened. Consider Samson. When he took the iron gates, put them on his shoulders, and he because Philistines were going to lock him in the city and they were going to kill him. And Samson uh, arose from the bed that he was laying in, went out and they shut the iron gates and Samson said, puny gates. He just picked them up, put them on his shoulders, walked on top of a hill. That's, I think it's a picture of Christ taking, shouldering what binds us you know, to Golgotha. But it occurred to me one day, where was Samson when the Philistines surrounded the city? He was in bed all right with a harlot. You see, men could not bring Samson down. Women could. And she did. But the thing is, Samson's strength was not in his own personal ability. His strength was through the seven spirits of God. That's what those seven locks in his hair were. Those seven locks were a foreshadowing of Christ in Revelation 5, who is the lamb who had seven horns on his head, which the Bible says are the seven spirits of God. And what I can, I can just take you all through the scripture and show you that the people that God used, the people that God blessed, that he worked through or worked for or did great things for them, gave them precious things. They didn't deserve it. Sarah, when the Lord and two angels came into Abraham's camp in uh, Genesis 18, Sarah laughed and then she lied about laughing to the Lord. And he told her, I know you laughed. Okay? I know you did. And I'm telling you, by this time next year, you're going to be carrying your son. He didn't give it to her because she was good gave it to her because that was his promise and he loved Sarah he loved Abraham and he loves us because out of that seed of Abraham came Jesus Christ to who sinners not good people okay so here's what the New Testament says about our flesh and how rotten it really is our, I'm getting weaker every day in my flesh all right but my faith is what's increasing. Okay? Now, I believe the Bible. I believe the whole Bible. But and it's kind of hard to express this except for this way. I believe every word in the Bible. But then you read something and God gives you an understanding of it. And boy, you're just, you're just going, wow, I really believe it now. You, you know, there's an emphasis there. And when I get these things from God, these precious gifts of these of wonderful things from this book. I don't go around bragging about it, gloating about it. I, I used to. Now sometimes it just makes me cry a little bit. Because I say, God, why did you show me that? I didn't deserve that. God says, I know. I know. That's the kind of God that he is. I love, I love God and I love this book. Let's see what the Bible says about our flesh and what its abilities are. Matthew 26, 41. 
Here's Jesus talking and he says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The Spirit in, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, I just caught something. I, I'm, ooh, ooh, I'm getting revelation of God. Ooh, hallelujah. Romans 7. Turn to Romans 7, okay? We may not get through all of this today, okay? We might, we might not. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, here it is. Here's Mike Hoggard. Mike Hoggard is a walking, living, breathing bundle of contradiction. Okay? That's who I am. I have the Spirit of God in me communing and fellowshipping with my spirit. That is the inner man that is in me. That new man that was uh, brought forth okay, some 41 years ago. Okay, I was nine years old. That inner man in me loves the Lord, loves the Bible, wants to read it all the time, wants to rejoice in salvation, wants to witness to people, wants to do all these wonderful good things. My spirit, in its will, its desire, in its every everything that my spirit wants is God's righteousness. The only thing stopping it is my flesh. And he used the word, Jesus used the word willing that has the word will in it, okay? Because there's a verse, and I don't have it in front of me, that says, and it's, and it's kind of bothered some people, for if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And I didn't quote that exactly, but you know the verse I'm talking about. It says, if we sin willfully, the word will is there. And in my inner man, my spirit, the will wants to serve God always, okay? But my flesh won't let it. So in Romans 7, you see the same thing that I just pointed out to you. Paul was talking about the contradiction that is in him. And he says here, he uses the word will in a, in a different form, but it's there. Um, let's see here, verse 14 of Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Spiritual and carnal. The two aspects of me, you, Paul, Peter, James, John, all the saints who have been born again, receive the Spirit of God, we have not instantaneously achieved sinless perfection in this flesh body. And it will never happen. Don't believe the lie that people tell you. And I've had that kind of stuff preached out of this pulpit in the past and I shut it down, okay? Lost some friends over it, but I just don't go for that. People telling everybody, you got, oh, you get this sinless perfection state, and yeah, then you don't sin anymore. That's not what your Bible says. So he says in verse 15, now look at your Bible. Either get your handheld Bible out, look at your tablet, look on the Pure Bible Search software. For that which I do, I allow not. This is verse 15. For what I would, you know what would is? It's a form of will. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Paul says, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Okay? He uses the word would. And then he says, verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You think about that. You think about what you really have on the inside of you in your flesh. And the next time you're ready to brag against somebody about how good you are, remember what's really inside of you that just wants to come out, okay? Whether it's words or deeds, okay? It wants out. It's no good thing dwelling in your flesh. Now look at verse 18 again. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will, there's that word, will, to, is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For to will is present with me. The Spirit indeed is willing. If we sin willfully, and what that means is you've changed now your will in your spirit. You've decided that enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season 
is what you want more than eternal life. You're Esau. Esau wanted to satisfy the desires of his flesh and he traded off what would have been his inheritance and his birthright. And we have churches full of people just like that. Okay? Some some drop out, they don't never come back to church again. Some sit there in every service. Amen the things they like. But the truth of it is, their inner man is just as corrupt or more corrupt than their outer man is. They have no willing spirit to serve God. And it's usually manifested by what they believe concerning the Bible. Uh, let's see here. Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. There's that word will in the form of would. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And so we can right, rightly say to God, God, you have my permission to cripple, weaken, destroy this flesh as it pleases you. You can do with me and my body whatever you want to do that brings glory and honor to Jesus Christ and not me. God, kill it at your earliest convenience. Amen. That's what you do. Okay? Because you know that the things that you hate doing, you do them. And your spirit is unable to do anything about it. Okay? Now, and it all has to do with the word would. Um, verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And that's the part that John was talking about in 1 John when he said, that which is born of God sinneth not. And, and again, some people would use that and they use the sin willfully part to say, well, the Bible says as Christians, we don't sin anymore. Well, we just don't sin anymore. And if you're still out there sinning, obviously you're not saved. That's not true. The Bible is here a little, there a little. You put it together and you get the picture now of what, of what God is teaching you. This flesh, my fingers and hair, those came from Milton and Judy Hoggard, my mom and dad. They were not born of God. They were made out of dirt. And they're going to return to the dirt. My father already has. I'm headed there. My mom is headed there. My children are headed there. My flesh is going to rot and be destroyed here. It was not born of God. It still sins. But the inner man that is in me, which is the renewed man, the inner man, the new man, the hidden man, the Bible uses all these terms about it, that doesn't sin. Never does. And never will. Okay? Um, an illustration. Oh, God, show me this one day. It was so beautiful. An illustration of the old man and having inside the old man the new man. The, the child of promise. There's an illustration in your Bible. You know what it is? Sarah and Isaac. Sarah... 90 years old. She's the old, decaying. Her time of fertility has long since passed. Okay? She is unable to bring forth children in her natural body. But yet, God works it in her. So now she is the old person that is passing away that contains in her the new man, Isaac, the child of promise, the child of hope. That child by which God is going to fulfill all of his promises to us. That's the picture of it right there. So I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, my eyes, my ears, my nose, my mouth, my hands, my feet, running to mischief. All right? 
O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You see how it works? This flesh, you, you are a walking, living, breathing contradiction like I am. My spirit so desires to serve and please God every single day. My spirit is it's, it's the part that's connected with God, that new man, that which is born of God. But my flesh is so weak. Okay? You take and study that word will, would, and so on. And you'll, you'll get an understanding of what John was talking about. I think it was John uh, when he said, if we sin willfully. Okay? And what I take that to mean is, you've, you've just decided, or not, let's say not you, but somebody you know, they was in church for a while, boy, it looked good, and they're out. And at some point, they just decided, I like sin too much. I'm going back. I'm going back out and sin. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to come back here. Okay? I want my sin. I want my alcohol. I want my women. I want my drugs. I want I'm stealing money. I want everything. Okay? That spirit sins willfully. They have changed their will. Uh, let's move on. John chapter 1. I hope I didn't muddy the waters for you in, in giving you that sort of that understanding. This is how I see it. And, I, and study Romans 7, and then Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now obviously, obviously, he just said in Romans 7, he just established that the flesh is the wicked part of us, which always contradicts our spirit. So he cannot be, in chapter 8, verse 1, speaking of a life of sinless perfection whereby we don't sin anymore. We don't lust anymore. We don't tell lies anymore. We don't do this. We don't do that. We have no sin after we get... He's obviously not talking about that. He's talking about the direction of your spirit, that inner man. It is walking after the Spirit of God. It is not clinging to the works of the flesh. It wants no part of it. And when God is ready, God is going to yank this new man out of me and leave the old man there to die in the dust. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh. Here he is, that will again. Nor of the will of man, but of God. See that word will again. My flesh its desires and its will, it, what it would do, contradicts what my spirit is willing and would do. Do you understand that? Okay. To me, it's just as plain. This body is going to go to the dust. God doesn't want it. it has, he has no use for it. Okay. We cannot please God in the flesh. And that's what all the Hebrew roots, the sacred name... Uh, all of the works-based salvations or works-based gospels or works-based blessings. Well, you're not wealthy? Well, it's because you're not uh, professing the name or you're not claiming these things in faith. Or It's always about what you're not doing. That when the health and wealth people get a hold of you, they say, if you will just do this, if you do that, if you perform this, if you, if you say it this way, then God will release these things to you. But God can't release them until you bring yourself into alignment with His righteousness and do these... That's a bunch of foolishness. I hate it. I hate it. Because all it does is it lifts man up where he can boast over others. Joyce Myers says, I'm wealthy because I deserve it. I'm not making that up. She said it in an interview with a local NBC affiliate here in St. Louis after the local paper, the Post-Dispatch, ran articles on her that did not make her look good. So her spin doctors got her an interview on the news and she said, I'm wealthy because I deserve to be. And she teaches everybody that she has this highest ability to perform the things good enough so that God can give her stuff. 
And here's all these poor people trying what she's telling them to do. And they're not getting rich. And they still have their diseases. And then they leave out of that eventually crumbled by the devil beating them and saying, See, you can't do that. God would heal your cancer. God would pay your bills. But you just don't deserve it and you're not going to get it. And people leave that stuff because it doesn't work. And that leaves them so unhappy with any kind of preacher whatsoever that it's only by the grace of God that they're ever brought to the truth. I do. I hate it. I hate, that, I hate their teaching. I hate their doctrine. I hate all of it. We are, we are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The will of God. My spirit is always willing. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can't do it. Only the Spirit can. Romans 4.11 or 4.1 through 11. Okay, that's a big chunk here. Let's let's try to get through some of this. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Belief. You believe this, God clothes you with His righteousness, not our own. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And I've even heard people say, well, with, with the Jews, God has a different gospel for them. It's the, it's the gospel of works plus grace. That's a lie. The Bible plainly says that if it's works, then it's... Um, given a reward out of a debt. God owes you something. Listen. God doesn't owe me anything. I've drug his name through the mud. I have, I have uh, embarrassed God and myself. Done things that he said not to do. Thought things. I'm not here because I deserve to be. I don't have anything because I deserve it. I have it because my Father loves me. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. On Saturday, the seventh day, the Sabbath, you know what I do? Normally, I rest. I'm at home. I sit in my chair with my heating pad. I'll read. Maybe I'll do a little study. Maybe I won't. Maybe I won't do anything. I take my rest. But just because I do that, that doesn't mean that God now owes me a sermon or a bigger paycheck or my back stop hurting or whatever. God doesn't owe me anything because I did one thing for Him. And that's what people would lead you to believe. They lead you to believe that they say, oh yeah, we can't keep all the law, but we keep as much as we can, and as much as we can is satisfying God. That's not what the Bible says. Read verse 5 again. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you get that? It's not to him that doeth, it's to him that did not. And this is what God is going to use to bring the Jews to jealousy. That God's going to glorify His Gentile people <clears throat> for doing nothing. While the Jews who have been, oh, we keep the law, we keep the law, liars. God's left them out in the wilderness all these years. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Verse 10. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. You go back. 
Genesis 12 is the first time God lays this promise out to Abram. That in blessing I will bless thee, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And out of thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God gave Abraham these wonderful things before he was ever circumcised. Before he ever kept any of the commandments of God, God had already given him these things. He didn't get it because he kept the law. God made sure to give him those blessings before he uh, was circumcised, before he paid tithes to Melchizedek. God had already given him those promises. Uh, verse... 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Be careful about this crowd too. And I started hearing this years ago and I'm going, it doesn't sound right to me, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I started hearing preachers talking about worship. They were doing sermons on worship and how you must worship and you must worship this way and you must worship several times a day and, and then they get down to it. And I, I finally caught on to it. What they were teaching was is that if you want something from God or you want to get closer to God or you want to have God return favors to you or give you money or give you this or give you that, if you want blessings from God, then you must worship God the right way in order to get it. And it, then it just clicked. They're teaching works-based or performance-based blessings. They're teaching a gospel that says, if you earn it, God will give it to you. Let me tell you something. When I worship God, I'm not worshiping Him because I think He's going to give me something. I worship Him because He's already given me everything. I knew it. I counseled with a pastor and his wife. And I loved them dearly. Pastor's a good man. His wife, she had challenges in her life. A lot of, she came from a broken home. This, her mother was tied into Joyce Meyer's ministry. And one Sunday, she just practically took the whole church service over and was yelling and screaming at people in the church because, according to her, they weren't spiritual enough. And she was tired of not getting blessings. And she felt like that if we really worship God the right way, then God would send revival to that church. And her poor husband, he, he didn't know what to do. He didn't want to embarrass his wife. But he knew that what she was doing wasn't right. And God gave me a little bit of wisdom. And I said, let me tell you what I think is going on here. What I think is going on is, is that you want God to release to you an emotional experience that gives you bliss, that gives you a euphoria, that gives you this feeling of you're accepted and you're loved and God's holding you close. And you think that if you are worshiping God and doing all these, saying these things and closing your eyes and crying a lot and trying to dispel any doubt and any negativity, that if you do these things, then God must do it. But see, the thing is, God's not giving them to you the way you want it. And you think it's because your own personal failure is not satisfying God enough and He won't release to you this little heroin rush that you get from an emotional experience. And I said, you're missing the point about Christianity altogether. It's not about what you do. It's about what Christ did, period. And God is ready to give you satisfactory blessings in your life. But I think he's withholding them from you because you're demanding that he gives them to you because you worshipped him a certain way. And I think God wants to show you that he'll give them to you when you least deserve it. Okay? You ponder that. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And so, I mean, we covered that, so I'm not going to cover it again. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And, and by the way, you can do this, okay? And you know me, I don't add to or take away from the Word of God. 
But when I see things that equal one another, like this, the word spirit, the spirit and the word of God are the same. Okay? The Spirit of God is His Word. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, we know that the Antichrist is going to be destroyed. Uh, let's see here. Verse 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What is the spirit of his mouth? And he capitalizes the uh, letter S in spirit here. Okay, no, no, I, no, I said that wrong. My mistake. Uh, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. What is the spirit of his mouth? It's this book right here. So look at Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Bible, the word of God, the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life. See, he connects it even there. The law is written in the book. The law of the spirit of life in Christ hath made me free. Let me show you this. Okay. Here is the beginning of the book of Matthew. Watch this. This is why your Bible has two parts. The law of, uh, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus is this right here, the New Testament. That's the law of the Spirit of life. This is the law of sin and death. Condemnation. This is eternal life. This is eternal damnation. And it all bears down to, and I know I'm kind of going long here, but it all comes down to there are people and teachers and Latter-day Prophets and all the, and YouTubers and bloggers who are constantly going to try to get you back under this covenant. Telling you what well, we do it and God gives us great things. God blesses us. God blessed Jim Staley so much he put him in prison for eight years. Because while Jim Staley was going around bragging about how he keeps the Passover and how he doesn't do the pagan things that you Christians do, he was stealing money from old men and old ladies. Go look it up. He's in prison right now. Okay? He was trying to get everybody back under the law. But he forgot, like, you know, thou shalt not steal. He forgot that part. So you choose. You choose. If you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved by... The law of liberty in the New Testament, which is based upon faith, or the law of sin and death, which is based upon performance, and if you make one mistake, you're out. You choose. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.23, read Romans 8, 1 through 15, and where you see the word spirit, think Bible. Okay? Um... Let's see here. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, the Word of Christ. The, see, Christ is the Word, right? He is none of His. Oh, I'm a Christian. I just don't believe the Bible. No. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 1.23 But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are the called, or are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. In the average Bible church congregation, how many lawyers, politicians, doctors, um, esteemed scholars, famous bankers. How many of those in a church? In a, let's say a, just a fundamental Bible-believing church. Not many. How many farmers? How many bricklayers? How many wood choppers? How many factory workers? It's a, it's a large majority in practically every church that you're going to get the common man there. Why? Because he doesn't have the things that these famous and wealthy and noble people have except what he gets from God. Okay? That's why. Um, verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 
God didn't call me. And I learned this. I figured this out. Because at one time in my life, I was very arrogant. And I said, Mike, with your talents, you'll be able to just climb the ladder of success. You can get any church you want. Um, you can sing. You can preach. You can respond to people. You can perform on stage. Boy, Mike, you can do all these great things. That's why God called me. My youth, I used to think that. Then God made me face reality. And God brought me down so weak and so unable. I literally, literally just wanted to stop everything. I wanted to get out of the ministry. I wanted to get out of life. I sat up in the bed one night weeping. And I said, honey, I can't do this. I can't do it. She said, yeah, you can. Okay? Then I realized God did not call me because I'm strong and I have these talents and I can do these things. God did not call me for that reason. He called me because I was weak. And weak people, they don't take the credit away from God. It's like the elephant and the rooster. The elephant and the rooster were walking and they came across a gorge and this you know, rickety old rope bridge with boards all broken up and everything like that. So they figured they'd go ahead and walk it. So here's the elephant and the rooster walking across that bridge. Boy, I mean, it's just doing this, you know. And the rooster looked up at the elephant and said, Boy, we're making her shake, ain't we? It ain't you. It ain't you. It's God. He called you because you're weak. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. And re- Look here. Wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay? That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I'm just, I'm just, I have not failed to see it. Not failed to see it. That anybody who teaches a works-based gospel, works-based salvation, works-based blessing from God, always boast over it. Always do. I have not found the exception yet. Well, I do this and I do that. And you don't do what I do. Boy, they're boasters. Okay? If we're going to glory, let's glory in the Lord for what he's done, not what we do. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Philippians 3, 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. I don't have no confidence in the flesh. The reason why um, we couldn't get a, a Bible study out is that I just went through like in December. And I just, you know, I'm dealing, still dealing with a lot of health issues, pain in my joints and different things like that. And some days are pretty bad. And I just did not have the ability to do what I want. What I want to do is preach and teach seven to eight times a week, every week. And because of the weakness of my flesh, sometimes I can't get that out. So I don't have any confidence in my flesh. My confidence is in the Lord always. That's who I've learned to trust. And I want you to trust that too. Okay? So the next time you're confronted by somebody, just just listen to their boasting. Just listen to them brag about how they keep how they keep Torah, they keep Passover, they keep this, they keep that. And the truth is they don't. Not the way the Bible says to do it. They don't do it. But they're going to boast about it. And when you hear their boasting, then let the Spirit of God tell you. You hear that? That's not me. That is not me. I didn't call you because I knew you'd be perfect. I called you because I knew that you would follow me. Because you can't be perfect. Okay? I understand and recognize that my particular ministry reaches out to people who have given up and who feel like they can't and have thought about just not being anymore because I'm on your side I know you can't but I know a God that can 
And he's proven that to me more and more and more every day. And I want you to see that. Look back at your life and see the things that God did for you and ask the question, was I being good or not good? Okay? And then you take, you'll start thinking about stories and types in the Bible. We mentioned Sarah. We mentioned Samson. These other people. Peter denied Jesus three times. And yet, he's the guy on the day of Pentecost preaching the first sermon. Peter's the guy that God used to make the first contact with the Gentiles, giving them the gospel. For, uh, that's Acts chapter 10. Did, God, did Jesus give all that to Peter because he was a good guy? No, he failed him. He cursed and, and denied Jesus three times. Yet he's in heaven. Okay, I love you. I love this book. We're going to continue on Galatians and study some more. There's some good, good things in here that I, I want to refresh my mind on. Maybe some new things we haven't learned yet. All right? Hope this was a blessing to you. I don't, I'm not sure that I said everything exactly perfectly correct. So forgive me in the weakness of my flesh that I didn't say everything perfect. But the Bible, it always does. All right? God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.